Hello. Thank you all for joining us for this seminar on the future of AI progress and economic growth. We have with us today Tom Davidson, who is a senior research analyst at Open Philanthropy. Uh, much of Tom's research focuses on forecasting the, the pace of AI progress and the ways in which it will transform key variables, such as the pace of economic growth. Um, in my view, he's produced some of the best work in this space, and basically anything that he's written on these topics is worth reading. Um, today, he'll be presenting on a recent draft report that he has written on takeoff speeds. In other words, the question of how fast and discontinuous we should expect future AI progress to be. Uh, Tom, we're very happy to have you with us, and I'll leave you to jump right in. Um, so as Ben said, I, I work as, at Open Philanthropy, which is um, the organ organization that does grant making relating to AI, but also does research to inform that grant making. And one of the biggest you know, reports I've been working on over the last year is, a, is this bit of research related to AI takeoff speeds, and that's what I'm going to be presenting on today. Um, so without further ado, I will share my screen and get started. Okay, so what does a compute-centric perspective say about AI takeoff speeds? Um, so I, rather than explaining what I mean by compute-centric, I'm going to first go into the first slide, which should give a bit of context on that and also what exactly we mean by AI takeoff speeds. Um, so what is, what is AI takeoff speeds? We can distinguish between um, two things, but on, on a high level, what AI takeoff speeds refers to is like whether human level AI is going to come as a kind of bolt from the blue that takes everyone by surprise, or whether there's going to be um, kind of precursors ahead of time that um, we can see and adjust to um, in advance. Um, but kind of, I, th I find it pretty useful to distinguish between two types of takeoff speed. Um, so the first is capabilities takeoff speed, which a rough gloss would be how quickly will AI improve as we approach and surpass human level AI. Um, so an example of a kind of very slow capabilities takeoff speed would be that a year before we develop human level AI, um, we develop AI that's kind of almost human level. Maybe it's like. Um, the capability of a teenager or um, of a young adult. And then, you know, in that last year, it kind of gradually improves to be kind of full human level AI. Um, and the example of a very fast capabilities take of speed would be that a year before we develop human level AI, we've kind of got something that's significantly less impressive. So something like um, mouse level intelligence. Um, and then there's just really fast progress in that final year. Um, but capability take of speed doesn't say anything about how we're actually using the AI, whether we're deploying or not, and what impact it's having on the world. Um, so we could, you know, for all capabilities, take of speed is concerned, just be developing these AIs in the lab and not using them for anything whatsoever. Um, but, you know, ultimately we care about AI because of its impact on the world. And so it is also useful to be thinking about impact take of speeds. Um, and again, the rough gloss here is how quickly will AI's impact on the world increase as we approach and surpass human level AI, with the stress there being on AI's impact on the world rather than its actual capabilities. So one, one kind of toy scenario in which these could come apart is that um, AI's capabilities improve um, kind of fairly gradually and slowly as we approach and surpass human level. Um, but initially, no one wants to use AI because they're worried about the risks and because of government regulation. And then um, past a certain point, AI gets smart enough to circumvent those regulations and human deployment decisions and kind of quickly roll itself out around the world um, and let's say do AI takeover. And in that kind of scenario I just outlined, um, AI's impact on the world um, goes very quickly from kind of almost nothing to a huge impact with AI takeover. And so AI impact speed is, is very fast, even though AI capabilities takeoff speed was um, much slower. Um, this talk is going to be mostly fo focused on capabilities takeoff speed. Um, I think it's easier to forecast and is one of the key inputs into impact takeoff speed. Um, I do, you know, I do have thoughts, um, you know, a few more thoughts on how these things differ, but just for this talk, I'm going to be mostly restricting to thinking about the capabilities take of speed. Um, 
Okay, so that's takeoff speed. So now this compute-centric framework thing. So the, um, the, the kind of zoomed out idea behind the compute-centric framework is that um, I'm assuming something like the current paradigm is going to lead to um, human-level AI and, and, and further. And I'm assuming that we get there by kind of scaling up and improving the current algorithmic approaches. So it's going to look like better versions of transformers that are more efficient and that allow for longer context windows and just kind of extending and improving the various components of today's AI systems. And you know, the kind of thing I'm ruling out, you know, includes an entirely new paradigm outside of deep learning, which where the approach is just very different and also includes, you know, types of chain algorithmic progress that could happen within deep learning that would just totally upend um, the kind of recent trends in scaling laws um, and in, um, in, in, in algorithmic improvements. So, you know, some people believe that there'll be some kind of adjustments you can make to our current algorithms where suddenly AI progress will go absolutely through the roof. This, this is a, um, a view I associate with Mary. There's going to be some kind of types of algorithmic change that just really are not like the ones we've seen over the past 10 years. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of um, you know, really radical algorithmic improvement that, that, that this framework is assuming does not happen. Um, and so um, you know, in, in this framework, the, the, the toy way the framework is set up is that the capability of your AI is just determined by the effective compute that you use to train the AI. And that effect of compute is, is defined as, you know, as simply as possible, really. So it's just the actual physical compute you use to train the AI. That's the number of flop you use in training, multiplied by some kind of measure of the quality of the algorithms you used um, in that training run. And, um, you know, there are ways that you can measure, and um, Epoch has some work on this, which I'll quote later, um, how that, how those quality of the algorithms have improved over time. But I will note up front um, that this kind of that that measuring the quality of AI algorithms is 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 a pretty hard and vexed thing to do. Um, and I think this this is just a, a real difficulty for for any approach to kind of that's trying to kind of quantify and, and measure AI capabilities very precisely. Um, but you know, in within this framework, it shows up within the kind of fuzziness over. You know, how do we measure and define this 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 quality of algorithms factor um, when we're calculating our effect of compute? But you know, the intuitive idea is just that you could use one e twenty four flop to train a system in um, twenty twenty, and then you could use one e twenty four flop again in twenty twenty five, and you'd get a better system because you'd had better algorithms. And maybe if if your algorithms are ten times as good, then your system is as good as if you'd used ten times as much compute in twenty twenty. Um, and that's the that's the kind of intuition behind that that factor. So that's the first part of the compute centric framework. You know the capability of our AIs. And the second part is that as as AIs get more capable, they automate more tasks, and this feeds back into accelerating AI progress in three ways. So the first way is that if you can automate more tasks, then you can do more flashy demos and um, you know have actual more economic impact by automating important tasks in the economy, and that will tend to drive more investment. So this is something you know, that, that we're already seeing you know, happening a little bit ahead of time, really, with um, investment in open AI kind of preceding the economic impact of ChatGPT. But the general pattern of AI being better and that leading to both more economic impact and more investment is true in that case. Um, then I think the next two factors are going to be more important, but historically have actually been less important um, to date. That is, as AI gets better, um, it's able to help out with the process of designing um, new chips and then maybe the process of running fabs to produce those chips. Um, and hence, you get faster hardware progress, a faster increase in the number of um, kind of physical flop you can use in your training runs. And we are getting a bit of this. Um, you know, there, there are reports of AI helping with. You know, the design of um, chips in, in, in various ways. And the third way is um, better AI automating you know, tasks that are currently involved in um, the design and testing and implementation of new AI algorithms. 
So that could be new architectures, new optimizers, or just new ways of combining AI systems like chain of thought. Um, and again, you know, the thought is just as AI gets better, it automates more of those tasks, um, and that speeds up the relevant kind of progress. Um, and this last, this last kind of feedback loop is especially fast because um, with the with the hardware and the investment, you need time for those investments to be made, and you need time for that hardware to be produced. But algorithmic progress is is kind of unique unique in that it can be you know, once you design a better algorithm um, and you've trained using that new algorithm if that's necessary you can kind of immediately apply that algorithmic insight and improvement across your whole existing stack of compute um, okay so that's that's kind of how we're thinking about the capability of AI um, and kind of how we're thinking about you know um, AI automating more tasks as it improves this is all so far, you know, a pretty continuous process. You know, the AI is getting continuously better. It's continuously automating more tasks. Um, but just for concreteness, it is useful to have one measurement, one kind of. Um, I don't think there is any choice, but the thing that I, I'm currently using is um, a calendar time from AI that can collectively automate twenty percent of economic tasks to AI that can collectively automate 100% of tasks. So a reminder from earlier, we're talking about capabilities, take of speed. So this isn't assuming that AI is actually deployed in the economy performing these tasks. It's assuming that if um, people made you know, a few months of effort to adjust and engineer and integrate these AIs in their workflows, then they would be able to um, automate 20% of tasks. Um, or 100% of tasks in terms of the endpoint. Um, and in terms of, you know, talking about 20% of tasks, how, how are we weighting these tasks? You know, what percentage would I give to, um, you know, telemarketing versus, versus driving? Um, and um, the answer to that is that tasks are weighted by what's called their share of output in economic talk, which is basically the share of GDP which is paid to, um, to people performing those tasks. So if um, you know, if ten trillion dollars in GDP is paid to people um, for driving, then driving would be um, ten percent of economic tasks. And these these percentages are are kind of pinned to um, 2022, which is when I was writing this report, um, because the the share of a various tasks like driving of the economy may may change over time. Um, one other thing about these tasks is that I am specifically restricting to cognitive tasks. So I would not include a task like, you know, actually physically lifting up a brick and putting it on top of another pile of bricks. But I would, would include the tasks like you know, writing a book, um, like designing new software, and including a task like planning out how someone should lift the brick onto another pile of bricks and planning out how that physical process should be carried out. You know, maybe even giving instructions to a robot or human that's doing the physical labor. Um, okay, so with this background um, that, I, that I've just laid out for the compute-centric framework, um, the take of speed depends on two things. The first I'm calling the difficulty gap. Um, so intuitively, the difficulty gap is just how, how much does AI have to improve? to go from automating 20% to automating 100% of tasks. And in the compute-centric framework, that is spelled out as how much more effective compute do you need to train AI that can automate 100% of tasks compared to AI that can automate only 20%. Um, so for example, if you needed 1,000 times more effective compute, then that would be meaning that maybe you need to in 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 increase your physical compute by 100x and your algorithms by 10x or some other combination. That, 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 that combines to give a thousand x improvement. The second one is your average speed crossing the difficulty gap. So that is once we kind of get over the start point, that 20% automation point, how quickly will we actually be increasing the effective compute used in training? Um, okay, so I'm gonna say a little bit more about this compute-centric framework. Um, it's, it's, you know, maybe a lot of, a lot of words on that last slide. So first, I'm just going to kind of show it in picture form. So this axis here, we have the effective compute used in training run increasing left to right. And that is just the axis along which the capabilities of RAI are increasing. So today, 
Um, I don't think we've got AI that can perform 20% of economic tasks. That would be worth many trillions of dollars. Um, but as we use more effective compute in our training runs, then eventually we will hit the point at which AI is capable enough to automate 20% of tasks. And then as we continue to increase our effective compute, AI will be automating more and more tasks, you know, 30, 50, 80%, and then eventually AI will automate 100% of tasks. And the difficulty gap is just the effective compute difference between those two points. So how many more times effective compute you need for the higher threshold than the lower one. And then we've got the speed, crossing that difficulty gap, so that's you know, each year, how, how much more effective compute are we, are, are we using, which allows us to move left to right along this axis. And as I said, that decomposes into using more physical compute in the training run and improving the algorithms that we're using for doing that training. I'm gonna speak a little bit more about the difficulty gap now. First, about what does it actually mean? Um, you know, I kind of gave this quite, um, quite sparse um, definition in terms of 20% to 100%. Um, and I think that um, this, this, this Hans Moravec's writing ties of, of AI capacity can just give it a little bit more of a visceral sense of what it means. So we have a landscape here and different parts of the landscape um, show different tasks that, that human minds are paid to do. As of as of as of today, um, and some of those tasks, um, or at least um, so, so some of the tasks that human minds used to be paid to do, at least, are, are kind of currently underwater, which means the AI can currently perform them. But there's many tasks which um, humans are still paid to do, um, which are kind of um, which are above above the waterline, and, and you can see various examples laid out. Um, and what the what the waterline represents is the kind of AI's current capability level, um, or in, in terms of my framework, the, the, the task that AI could today readily automate if we tried. And then over time, this, this, um, this, uh, this tide of AI capacity will rise, um, and more and more tasks that today humans are paid to perform, AI will be able to automate. Um, and you know, in, that, in that framing, um, the way we can think about the difficulty gap is that at some point the tide will have risen high enough that 20% of today's tasks weighted by economic value today, um, AI will be able to perform. And then at some later point, the tide will have risen even further such that um, AI can perform literally 100% of economic tasks. Um, and so um, in, that, in that framing, the meaning of the difficulty gap is just how much more effective compute do you need to write for the AI, for this kind of tide um, of AI capacity to rise up from that 20% level to the 100% level. And what I like about this, about this way of um, thinking about the difficulty gap is it just highlights the, the huge variety of tasks that are in the, the economy. Um, and I think gives some intuitive motivation for thinking that this difficulty about gap might be pretty large. You know, there might be certain parts of this landscape which are just a lot easier for AI to do than, than others. Here's another angle on the difficulty gap. Um, here's another diagram. So again, we have um, left to right um, with representing the effective compute used to train AI and therefore the AI's capability in our, in our framework. Um, and then the height of the line at each point shows how many tasks are you automating um, as you um, train AIs um, that are this good. Um, so, you know, initially we're not automating that many tasks as we improve our AI. Um, and then in this diagram, we kind of start automating tasks very quickly until all of the tasks have been automated at the far right. I mean, I think today we are on the left tail. Um, AI, though it's doing some exciting things, um, has not had massive economic value, and you know labs have been trying to um, to deploy um, their their systems and 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 to and to make money from them. But my sense is that they you know mostly they're driven they're investment driven rather than um, revenue driven in terms of how how labs are raising their money. Um, so I think though AI is very impressive in in in, in many narrow places, it's not yet um, kind of automating anything like the bulk of, of tasks, so we're in the left tail. But I also, I do buy 
the kind of various arguments that it's plausible that within the next few decades we will get AI that can kind of completely um, obscure human um, cognitive abilities and we'll be able to automate 100 percent of tasks so that's the kind of point on the far left and then if you believe that and you believe that today AI, AI hasn't done much then you're kind of forced to believe that there's going to be this hump where there's a period where AI will be you know automating tasks much more quickly than it is at its current rate um, and um, the meaning the difficulty gap in in this kind of framework is is basically how wide is that hump you could think that all of the tasks are going to be automated basically all at once and you can have a very tall and narrow hump on the far right or you could think that yeah you know there's going to be a pretty gradual increase um, in height of this line and there's going to be a fairly wide hump um, and that's just another way of thinking about um, the meaning of the difficulty gap Okay, so going back a few slides, um, in this theoretical framework, takeoff speed depends on the, gift to go keep the difficulty gap and the speed crossing the difficulty gap. So now I'm going to go through each and give some quick, um, quick explanation of some of the reasons that can inform your judgment about how um, big these, 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 these quantities are likely to be. So starting with the difficulty gap, um, you know, this is this is a really kind of involved and, and complicated and also very speculative part of the report. Um, and I'm not going to be going into the details of, of the arguments today, but you, 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 know, you should feel free to dig into the report to, to kind of see, see my, the explanations of my reasoning in, in, in a lot more detail than, than I'll be giving here. Um, but here, here are some arguments, here are some reasons to think that the difficulty gap could be pretty small. So one, the first reason is that it seems as if um, there's a fairly large effect of brain size on intelligence in both humans and more speculatively animals. So you can look at correlations between um, brain size, like the, the physical kind of um, radius of the human skull and um, with scans just the size of the brain um, and cognitive ability. Um, in humans, and you know there is um, you know, not, not not a super strong correlation, but there is you know, a definite effect there, which um, when extrapolated to imagining increases in brain size, there's something like ten um, three times bigger or ten times bigger in humans um, suggests that the intelligence gains from that would be would be pretty pretty large. Um, and similarly with animals, that though much more speculatively, it does seem as if there's a you know that, that relatively minor increases in brain size, say between chimps and humans, um, perhaps accompanied by some some architectural differences as well, um, but relatively um, minor differences there led led to like intuitively pretty big differences in intelligence. I mean, I think that that one's a lot harder to to assess um, with 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 you know the role of cultural evolution. Um, and 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 the kind of different different purposes that 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 chimp and human brains are kind of designed for, but um, you know I think I think the overall takeaway from this evidence is that there does seem like that there is just this pretty big effect between brain size and intelligence, and um, you know that that extrapolated in like a kind of number of kind of fairly reasonable seeming ways suggests this kind of fairly small difficulty gap of of one or two orders of magnitude. And just clarifying, one to two orders of magnitude here means one to two orders of magnitude of effective training compute needed to go from 20% um, to 100% automation. And um, another reminder that if you, if you kind of double the training compute twice, then you only double the brain size once. Um, so that's why I briefly referred to kind of a 3x or a 10x increase in human brain size, because that would kind of roughly correspond to a one order of magnitude or two order of magnitude increase in um, effective training compute. So a second argument for a small difficulty gap is that it's just pretty kind of gnarly and hard in practice to automate just 20% of a job. You know, you can imagine in your own case, imagine trying to get an AI to perform 20% of the tasks that you currently spend your time on. Um, and it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty kind of difficult to factor out that 20% when probably a lot of the things you do are kind of very much entangled with each other. Now, now the normal way we solve this historically is to have, um, you know, years and in fact decades rearranging workflows um, to allow 
um, that 20% automation to happen. Um, and that is that is one way that things could go with AI. But if you believe that the time when we get to um, you know 100% automation is just say 10 years away, or even if you just believe that there'll be maybe a five year or 10 year gap between the 20% AI and the 100% AI, then there's not going to be time to do the normal world first. And in that situation, um, you know, in fact, it might just be pretty hard to, to even automate 20% um, of your workflow in the first place. Um, and that means that by the time the AI is able to actually automate 20% of your workflow, it's not too far from being able to automate, you know, almost all of your workflow um, because of that entanglement. A third reason I've alluded to, but if you just think we're pretty close to being able to train AI that can automate 100% of economic tasks, then um, you just can't think that there's a big difficulty gap because we haven't yet got into AI that can automate 20%, and then that just kind of strictly bounds how, how, how large that that um, that difficulty gap can be. There are also some you know reasonable arguments for for very large difficulty gaps. What one I've already alluded to just the economy has a huge variety of tasks that differ along many dimensions, um, including um, how much memorization they use and benefit from, including um, the horizon over which they're performed over. You know, are they five minute episodes? Are they five year episodes? How how much um, do the, does the cognitive work involve manipulating things in the world? How much does it involve social interaction? How 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 much does the task you know really require a very very low um, fault frequency? You know how much does it must the AI be super reliable to automate the task? Um, and because of that variety, it just seems pretty plausible that AI will be readily or able to automate some tasks. You know perhaps quite a long time before others. And you know relatedly, to the last AI just seems much better. Most obviously, tasks which are similar to its pre-training objective, um, AI just has a lot of very relevant experience in. Um, and some tasks in the economy are similar to the, um, the pre-training objective, and some some tasks are just are just less similar. Um, you know, other things here are tasks in which we have um, data and demonstrations for tasks where it's easy to assess whether the output was good. Um, versus needing to kind of almost redo the whole reasoning in order to tell um, tasks that um, um, that can be done purely digitally and that don't involve um, sim to wheel transfer, um, AI, AI will also be better at. And lastly, some types of AI are more expensive to train than others. So, particularly here, I have in mind reinforcement learning. Um, if you want to train an RL agent that has the same number of parameters as a kind of a transformer model, then the RL agent typically takes a lot more um, training compute. Um, you know, I think something like four orders of magnitude more um, was 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 the number I, I I have cached in my memory there. So if you know if twenty percent of tasks require RL and the other eighty percent can be done by transformers with a few tricks, then um, you know, if, if we need the same number of parameters, parameters for both in order to achieve the automation, then that would that would create a pretty large difficulty gap there. Um, and you know, big big difficulty gaps go hand in hand with thinking that the training requirements for for AGI for 100% automation are very high. Now, my median takeaway from this um, in the report is is kind of three or four orders of magnitude. Um, so that's about three thousand. Um, 3,000 times more effective compute needed for 100% than 20%. But, you know, the real takeaway here is not, you know, that particular number, but just that there's, you know, lots of considerations which push in different directions, and none of the considerations are very convincing. Um, and so there's just a lot of, you know, really massive uncertainty. But 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 I, I would say I do take, you know, both 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 parts pretty seriously. Like I do think one order of magnitude is plausible, and I also think, you know. Six, seven, eight orders of magnitude, um, also somewhat plausible. Okay, so we've talked about the difficulty gap. Um, now I'll talk about the speed crossing that difficulty gap, or rather the average speed. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's worth remembering that as we cross the difficulty gap, um, 
as going to be automating more and more tasks. And so our speed crossing that difficulty gap will actually get faster and faster as we cross. Um, so we can start just by looking at data from the last decade. And um, massive thanks to Epoch for, for, for the work they've done um, compiling this data. So um, the compute in large learning graphs is order of, of magnitude per year. There's each year we've gone about um, 0.6 of the way to a 10x increase in um, effective compute, um, or rather just physical compute used in the training run. So I think that corresponds to like a 4x increase per year, roughly. Um, Mind own OOM here is just an order of magnitude, a 10x increase. And you can decompose the compute increases further into compute getting cheaper and to more spending, and it's currently almost all coming from more spending. Um, They've also estimated um, algorithmic progress on um, ImageNet um, AIs. Um, and they find that that is about 0.4 ooms per year. There's massive uncertainty with that estimate. And just you know, a big, big uncertainty in this whole analysis is that it's really hard to get a handle on algorithmic progress. And there's kind of interesting conceptual questions about you know, should we be applying the ImageNet rate of progress to progress towards AGI um, and other such things. But at least taking these, these estimates of face value that suggest one order of magnitude um, improvement per year, that's a 10x increase per year in effective compute over the last decade. And at the bottom here, I've shown that kind of um, how that decomposes into more spending, cheaper compute, and better algorithms. The question we're interested, though, is not what happened last decade, but once we get to that 20% automation threshold, how quickly will the effective compute and the largest training run, run increase from that point? Um, and so I'm going to think of this in terms of, um, in terms of deltas to the last decade. So the first one con concerns spending. I think that could go either way. I think if there are fairly short timelines, then we could see spending rising more quickly than it has done recently when certain kind of large actors wake up to the economic and strategic implications of TAI um, and kind of par money in to get over the line or there are mergers between various organizations um, so that there's more compute access. On the other hand, especially if timelines are longer, um, we could just kind of hit limits on budgets or limits on like literally you're already using 5% of the world's chips and it's hard to get more on that before we um, have crossed the difficulty gap. And that could mean that spending past that point increases more slowly than it has done historically. Um, the second factor, I think, is, is going to push in the direction of crossing the gap more quickly. Um, so I think AI is going to speed up AI R&D progress. And, and I've discussed that already on the first slide. Um, that means the price of compute will fall more quickly. There'll be faster algorithmic progress. And when you plug this into like a kind of pretty standard task-based model of automation, it seems like a two or three X increase in the pace of R&D progress is plausible. Um, so I plugged in a two X increase um, into this table at the bottom, um, and um, I plugged in a, a kind of more conservative estimate of, of slower spending increase. Um, and that nets out as you know, a somewhat faster speed crossing the difficulty gap in the future when we actually do that. And we can then just combine those, those kind of estimates of the difficulty gap size and the speed crossing it to get some kind of a range of estimates of takeoff speed. So I've just taken the kind of estimates from before for the difficulty gap, and then I've added in a kind of aggressive and conservative estimate for the speed crossing the difficulty gap um, by, by, by changing some of, the, some of those kind of adjustments. Um, in, in, in ways that seem to go either way. And you know, the the way that um, the way the way that it's looking to me is that um, you know median is about you know three years, you could easily say four or five years, you could say two years, um, but but roughly in that ballpark seems right. Um, I think it, it is plausible that takeoff speed could could take less than a year. Um, I think the small difficulty gap is plausible, um, especially on short timelines. And I think quickly crossing it is plausible, again, especially on short timelines. Um, 
and so I think that that, that aggressive estimate is 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 is, is realistic. It's not, it's not something out of the question at all. Um, but also, especially on long timelines, I think there could be a big difficulty gap, and we could cross it fairly slowly. And so I you know I also think the, con the conservative estimate here is plausible. Um, here's here's a visual representation of of um, kind of the what you get when you do a Monte Carlo and you have uncertainty over many of the variables I've discussed here and many variables that I haven't discussed here. Um, and so on the, on the x-axis we have um, kind of the year in which we train AI that could readily automate 100% of economic tasks. And on the y-axis we have you know the, the, the gap in years between AI that could automate 20% and AI that could automate 100% of economic tasks. Um, and you know the, the big takeaway from this diagram is that um, th there's a pretty strong relationship between um, the um, kind of AI timelines on the one hand and takeoff speeds on the other, where shorter AI timelines seem to be um, pretty strongly associated with faster takeoff, um, and that's you know for reasons I've indicated that the difficulty gap tends to be smaller um, with. Um, with shorter timelines, and that the kind of possibility to quickly ramp up spending um, is much greater with shorter timelines. This is this is kind of pretty opposed to the view that, for example, many people at OpenAI seem to have, where they seem to have a kind of short timelines, slow takeoff um, default. Um, so I think that this, this is a potentially pretty important update um, if if you're making plans and strategies around that view. Okay, so so what? Why does this matter? Well. Takeaway for me is that this is like a pretty fast takeoff speed um, that's being suggested by the analysis, um, and no discontinuities are baked into the model. Um, so, you know, historically, discussion of takeoff speed has often been around whether there's going to be a kind of secret source or like a kind of crazy tipping point. And, you know, in this model, there's just AI that gets continuously better and that continuously automates more and more tasks. Um, and the fact that despite that, despite kind of assuming the continuity side of things, that you get a pretty fast takeoff um, is, is a pretty notable result. And you know, there's a number of strategic implications there. So faster takeoff means less time to study AIs that are that are similar to those that will pose X risk. So ideally we'd have you know many years studying you know prototypes of, of the dangerous type of AI so we can study their behavior um, and understand how to make them less dangerous. But you know, if we only have a year or so, then we won't have much time for that. Um, it also means um, less time when we could use really capable AIs to kind of help us solve, for example, AI alignment before um, the AI itself poses X risk. Um, so that that is also um, a kind of a downside of of faster takeoff. It means we're going to get fewer warning shots of, of really, really impressive AI capabilities, um, or at least those warning shots will happen with, you know, with less time to spare before um, X risk is, is, is high, um, which could lead to potentially fewer actors being involved um, in, in dynamics that play out. Although I would say, you know, three years seems plenty of time for, for, for more labs and governments to, to get involved. Um, I think fewer warning shots for AI risk is another, another implication here. Um, which 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 can mean we shouldn't expect there to be you know massively enhanced consensus and coordination um, when the period of X, AX risk is high. Although again, you know, three years is still plenty of time to get to get some warning shots. Uh, it's easier for power imbalances to emerge if takeoff is faster because the actor that is ahead um, goes through like a faster increase in the quality of the AIs. Um, it also means um, that. There's less time for AI to, you know, really transform the economy before it poses X risk. You know, if there's only three years from AI that could automate 20% of tasks, then it seems unlikely that it will have actually automated many of those tasks just three years later. Um, but by that time, if AI can now automate 100% of tasks and poses X risk, then the world won't be very transformed by the time um, we have um, AI that poses X risk. Um, and this, you know, this happens to suggest that a kind of a type of a style of analysis, which is being done by Holden, the near cast, um, where you kind of assume that many dynamics will be the same as today, and try and think about what labs should do, may, maybe looks a bit better than it would do if, if the world was going to be dramatically transformed. Um, 
I'm going to quickly kind of say a few things about a natural, a natural kind of point of confusion or objection here, which is, you know, with, you've been focusing on this 20% to 100% um, notion and 20% is a kind of pretty arbitrary start point. And I think that's correct. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a, a kind of principled way of choosing when should we start the clock, when should we, should we stop the clock on takeoff speeds. But I do want to choose some start point because people just find the kind of Canada time interval like a pretty intuitive thing to think about. Um, but if, if you really don't want to do that, you can just look at graphs like this one that just show kind of relevant curves over time. So how is how is software improving over time in green and how is hardware improving over time in, in blue? I saw in, in yellow at the top. Um, and how is the, you know, and various other quantities here relating to the kind of um, number of flop, fraction of the world's flop being used on the largest training run. Um, so, so if you want to avoid kind of arbitrary start points and endpoints, we can just look at the curves. Um, although it's kind of, it is a bit less intuitive when you do that. Um, another thing we can do is we can look at snapshots of the world. Um, like, yes, you know, this graph is saying, let's look at a snapshot of the world one year before 100% automation and two years and five years and 10 years before. And let's look at how, you know, how quickly GDP is growing and how quickly software is growing and hardware is growing. And so, you know, if you want to kind of um, interact and kind of drop the implications of the, of the framework in a way which doesn't just reduce down to this, this kind of time interval between two, two somewhat arbitrary points, um, you know, that, that's, that's another way of doing that. The last thing I want to very briefly touch upon, but, but I won't be able to do justice, is just another relevant question in the vicinity of AI takeoff speeds, which is um, time from 100% automation to super intelligence. Um, this is, you know, th this is arguably, you know, a very important input to thinking about um, AIX risk, um, the kind of time from AI systems being being out, being extremely useful, um, and being able to kind of automate, you know, pretty much everything that we're doing. For example, in AI R and D, to being way way superhuman when it's pretty pretty plausible that they pose that risk. Um, and I think I think that there's a, it's plausible this happens very quickly. Um, and and just very briefly, the reasons for that are that once you can train um, AI that 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 that, that is um, good enough to to automate 100% of tasks, or or we could even take a let's say 80% of tasks or 60% of tasks. Either way, you're going to get a huge number of those AIs that you can then immediately deploy just because of the ratio between the training compute required and the runtime compute required. And so it seems like you know as soon as we reach these kind of these these um, kind of high levels of percentage automation, we're going to have huge addition, huge additions to our workforce. Which you know you know when I when I run the analysis, even even accounting for for, for bottlenecks and stuff, seems like it's going to um, significantly accelerate progress. And ex and progress is already pretty quick um, in terms of measurements we have of, of software progress. Um, a second thing is that this is complicated to explain mathematically, but you can kind of look at um, the rate at which algorithms seem to improve as you apply more effort to improving them. And it seems like that they, they, they improve at a fairly fast rate, such that if you double the effort to improving them, the algorithms more than double in terms of their quality. And, and that turns out to imply that if you fully automate the process of improving algorithms, then they could just improve at an accelerating rate. Um, which with a possibility that I, I sometimes refer to as the software only singularity. Um, now I, don't, I think that you know there are things that cut against that, but at least that, that's what the naive, any naive analysis suggests. Um, and the last reason why I think this could happen very quickly is that around this time I expect people to be very, um, very you know, AI to be adding huge amounts of value and people to be very keen to, to be investing more in it. It's suggesting that the amount of physical compute could be growing very quickly and also benefiting from you know, AI R&D that's been done by kind of AI that can automate 50% and 60 and 70% of tasks, kind of also driving that fast growth of physical compute. I don't think this is guaranteed by any means. You know, I think 50-50 is um, you know, a pretty plausible stance on whether, whether this happens quickly. Um, the reasons being like perhaps just Software progress, algorithmic progress, just bottleneck by needing more compute. You know, maybe discovery of transformers and discovery of other algorithmic improvements has just mostly been just driven by doing loads of experiments. Um, and it's going to take time to actually build more fabs and print more chips. Um, and that could just delay um, 
that algorithmic progress. And another thing feeding to that could be if, if um, you know, we hit the limits to Moore's law and even the AI automation isn't enough to get around that. Um, but, you know, my, my current guess, and, you know, I don't think I've justified this, um, but my current guess for what it's worth is that this, this is more likely than not to happen um, pretty quickly in less than a year. Lastly, there's some, you know, there are many major limitations of, of, of the whole framework. Um, I'm just going to list some of the biggest ones. So I'm not thinking at all about data environments or reinforcement learning signals. I'm, I'm not modeling a lag between actually developing the AI and then deploying it in AI R&D. Um, I'm assuming that AI capabilities improve continuously, as I mentioned, um, which, which cuts towards a slower takeoff. Um, and I'm making this, you know, very toy assumption that the capability of an AI system is just given by multiplying its training compute by the quality of its algorithms. And there's this huge question mark about how we actually um, understand, um, you know, or measure the quality of those algorithms. Okay, thanks very much. All right, thank you so much for the presentation, Tom. Uh, for anyone who wants to learn more, um, I highly recommend reading Tom's full draft report, which is entitled what a compute-centric framework says about AI takeoff speeds. You should be able to find that online. Uh, we're going to move now to uh, the Q&A session, but I think that this won't be included in the online recording. Uh, so if you're watching us later on, thanks so much for joining, um, and see you.